I have the great pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. Annika Rudolf, who's a scientist working at the Niels Bohr Institute in uh, Copenhagen. She's an astroparticle physicist. Um, and uh, Sylvia Su, who's uh, working at DESI and is an astroparticle physicist as well. The two of them are going to be talking about gamma ray bursts and boats, which to my great surprise has nothing to do with uh, floating vessels. Um, so, um, no, it's, uh, as an avid US sports follower, I know about GOATS, which is also an acronym that uh, is very similar to this one. Now, I'm curious to see uh, what we'll learn about um, gamma ray bursts today. Please welcome Annika and Sylvia. Okay, let's go. Um, we're super happy to be here. I'm Annika. I'm a theoretical astroparticle physicist. This is Sylvia. She's an astronomer. So we brought together theory and observations to bring to you gamma ray bursts, which are our passion, or actually more our job. Um, we're going to be talking today about the most extreme explosions that you can imagine in the universe. They outshine the complete sky during their short duration. They're extremely energetic, and spe specifically, we want to talk about an event that happened last year that was record-breaking in all senses. It even made it to the common news headlines, as you can see. So very bright, very energetic, super fancy astroparticle physics, but also we want to talk about a boat. Before we can do that, um, we will need a bit, of a, history, a bit of an introduction, and that is going to be given by Sylvia. Yeah, so let's set the stage. Let's turn back time a little bit, and we're going to go back to the middle of the last century to a very, uh, not very well-known event called the Cold War. So during this time, of course, everyone is trying to build nuclear weapons. Once you build a nuclear weapon, you also have to test that weapon. And you also want to make sure you know if you're, the other team is testing nuclear weapons, right? So in order to do that, you could launch satellites that are uh, with the goal of looking for, ex for uh, evidence of nuclear testing on Earth. And this might be evidence in the form of uh, bright flashes of very energetic photons known as gamma rays. And before I go further, Anytime you see um, an IM with a number next to an image, that's just a reference for that image if you want to go find out more information about it. Anytime you see an R with a number, that's a reference to further reading. Um, and this is all in the description, I believe, of the event as well, or of the talk as well as the slides. So lots more you can read and look at if you want to. So going back to the Cold War, satellites called the Vela satellites were launched to look for signs of nuclear testing. So they're looking for flashes of gamma rays from the atmosphere. And instead, they find flashes of gamma rays from the universe. So somewhere in the universe, something is producing these bursts of gamma rays, or very creatively, we call them gamma ray bursts. This, what you're seeing here, is a plot from the discovery paper, from the very first paper. And this might be the, I think this is the very first gamma ray burst that was detected by us. Um, and again, very creatively, you see this fancy name, 670702, what kind of very cryptic serial number is that? Yeah, it happened in 1967, in July uh, the 2nd. Uh, so, this is, so now you know the naming nomenclature for GRBs. It's very straightforward. Um, yeah, so we were all, we, I wasn't alive then. Everyone in the community was very excited and surprised by these gamma ray bursts from space. And now came the question, well, what are these? And it took a while to answer this question of what are these, where are they coming from? Um, because once you discover something that you weren't expecting, you then have to go back to your funding agencies and say, can you please give us more money? You take that money to your engineers and say, can you please build us this new thing? And then you have to send it off into space. It's a whole set of processes. And so for a couple of decades, gamma ray bursts or GRBs were still, you know, we didn't know too much about them. And this changed in the early 90s when we finally started launching satellites with telescopes that were aimed at detecting and finding and characterizing and observing these gamma ray bursts, uh, satellites such as the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. And so the number of GRBs that we knew about and that we could really uh, observe, uh, that we really observed, just exploded in the early 90s. And once we had more information, once we had more observations of, of GRBs, of gamma ray bursts, we started to tease out uh, some facts about them. We started to understand them a bit better. And these flashes of gamma rays, it turns out, they can look very different. 
They could be as short as a second long, or even less than a second long. They could be as long as minutes. So there's a wide variety of behaviors you could find in a gamma ray burst. And this flash of gamma ray burst we call the prompt emission, just because it comes very promptly. It's very short and quick. Um, and what you're seeing in the middle here is just a bunch of examples of what we call light curves. And this just tells you how bright something is over time. So you see there's a variety of behavior in these GRB light curves. But there's more information you can get from a light curve than just how bright was it over time. You can see that some of these peaks are really short. And in fact, if you dig down into the data, the peaks can be as short as milliseconds. So that's very short. It's a little surprising because it's coming from space somewhere. So somehow a very short burst of energy is coming to us from space. If you then add up all of the energy, if you take all of the photons that your detector measures and you kind of extrapolate and you do some calculations, you find that the energy measured by your detector can be as high as 10 to the negative 11 joules per centimeter squared. Wait, what does that mean? This number is hundred times, hundreds of times as brighter than the average steady source, or the brightest steady source in the sky. So this means that when a gamma ray burst occurs for your gamma ray detector, it's hundreds of times brighter than everything else, anything else around it. So it really is a spectacular event. From these gamma ray bursts, we were also able to get a bit more information about where are they coming from. Because the main question is, are they coming from inside our galaxy, or are they coming from other galaxies? If they're coming from inside of our galaxy, then we should see more gamma ray bursts where the Milky Way has a lot of stars. And so when we look at the Milky Way, we should be seeing a lot of gamma ray bursts as well, if we plot those on top of each other. If they're coming from outside of our universe, then they should be distributed throughout the sky. We should see as many above as below. We should see them coming from everywhere. And so in fact, when we looked at where the gamma ray bursts were coming from, they are coming from all over the sky. And so this is a, a plot of basically many years of observations of gamma ray bursts. We're pretty, clear, we're pretty sure they're coming from everywhere, so they're not just coming from the Milky Way. But what does that mean? That means they could be coming from very, they could be very close to us, or they could be very far away from us, and we still don't have the smoking gun of, well, how, what is the distance to these gamma ray bursts? So that had to wait a little bit longer until we had observatories that could really locate where the GRB was coming from. So these are observatories such as Beppo Sachs and other observatories later. These are ones that could really locate where the GRB was. This is important because once you know where a GRB is, where it went off, you could go back to it hours later or days later. You could go back to that part of the sky. You can take an image of that sky with your X-ray or your gamma ray instrument, and you could see if there's still something there. Because we already know with a gamma ray burst, you get a bright flash of gamma rays, fine. But then we learned that after this flash of gamma, of, of gamma rays disappears, you still have some residual fading emission. And this emission, this what we call the afterglow emission, we sometimes detect it for hours, but we sometimes detect it for months after the GRB first went off. And with the afterglows, this is, again, light curves, so just brightness over time. You see they all start out pretty high and they all decay, but the way the decay is a little bit different although there are some patterns. Um, and so with GRBs, not only do you have prompt emission that might look different, you also have afterglow emission that might look a little different. A bonus, when you have observatories that can really tell where the GRB is pointed, or where the GRB is located, those observatories can now communicate with other observatories, including ones that are good at taking spectra. Now, what is a spectrum? So a spectrum just basically if you just take a look at an optical spectrum, um, basically all of these objects in the universe, they shine. They shine uh, across a wide range of wavelengths of different colors in the optical spectrum. Um, and depending on what material is there in that object or around it, you also see these dark features. Um, and these features, again, depend on the material, so they're linked to certain um, atoms or certain molecules, and so we know, we understand very well where those features should occur. So uh, what wavelength they should be at. But when you take a spectrum of an object and you put it in another galaxy, we know that all of the galaxies are, are in the universe, the universe is expanding. So those galaxies are moving farther and farther away from us. What this means is that those features move to longer wavelengths or to the redder part of the spectrum. And so these features are redshifted. And by finding the distance between when where you expect them to be and what they actually are, that tells you the distance to your gamma ray burst.
that tells you the redshift. And so when we did that, we found that gamma ray bursts were located at redshifts of all the way up to the early universe, so redshifts greater than one. This translates to when the universe was, you know, uh, only eight billions of years old instead of 13 point something billions of years old, all the way up to when the universe was less than a billion years old. So these are really gamma ray bursts. These are really objects going back in cosmic time. So these were the clues that we had. We knew that gamma ray bursts would uh, showed rapid variations, so smaller than a millisecond, quite small. We also knew how much energy we could measure by the detectors. Um, but we also knew that these really rapid, really energetic objects were coming from billions of light years away. So, Anika, what does that tell us then about what a gamma ray burst actually is? Okay, um, let's first take these clues step by step. The first one, the rapid variability, it kind of means that something very compact has to be involved, something that is capable of generating a variable signal on a such short time scale. Typical objects here are black holes or neutron stars, the small black holes, the stellar mass ones, not the big ones in the center of galaxies. In addition, if we know the energy detected uh, on Earth and we know how far away they are, we can calculate how much energy that is intrinsically. And that's, it, as it turns out, it's quite a lot of energy. And this hints towards the fact that the um, emission is not isotropic, but instead it's focused in a jet that goes out of that central object on the bottom and on the top. By the energy those gamma ray photons have, we also can kind of deduce that this jet must be moving at relativistic speed, so close to the speed of um, light. Okay, in the next few slides, I'm gonna be walking you a bit through how do we think a GRB is made? Like from what generates the compact object, how do we get the jet, and how does the jet produce the gamma rays? What do we think generates the, this new compact object? Well, with, these, with the population of GRBs that we finally had end of the 90s, people soon realized that we don't have one population of GRBs, but instead there is two. This can be easiest seen by the distribution of the duration. Um, on the one hand, you have short duration gamma ray bursts, which last less than two seconds. That's the blue population here. And by some theoretical arguments, but also by observational constraints, we are not quite sure that these shorter GIBs, they come from the merge of two compact objects. So you have two neutron stars that merge, or a neutron star and a black hole. In both cases, you create a new compact object, which then makes your GIB. The most spectacular confirmation for this was when, in 2017, we caught the gravitational wave of a neutron star merger, and we could actually associate it with a short GRB. That's, I mean, in, in my view, that, that means, okay, we're sure, this is yeah, the theory, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Um, on the other hand, the long GRBs, there the compact object is generated in the collapse of a very massive star. Um, again, here we have some theoretical arguments, but also we have supernova associations that support this. Okay, so these are kind of the progenitor systems. This is what was there before the GAB. But we need a compact object. How do we get that in the two cases? Let's start with the short ones, right? So you have a neutron star and a neutron star, or a neutron star and a black hole. They in spiral, they get closer, and at some point, either the neutron stars merge or the neutron star is tidally disrupted and torn apart by the black hole. And then maybe through a brief period of a hypermassive, not so stable neutron star, in the end, you end up with a black hole. That is the new central black object that we were looking for. And in both cases, because there was these neutron stars to begin with and there was a lot of stuff, you typically have some accretion going on around this black hole. Now, what comes in handy is that we know, or we have theories since the 70s actually, that if you have a black hole which is magnetized and which spins very fast, that can, you can launch a jet. Great. There's also some people who say, okay, this jet could be launched by the hypermassive neutron star that is in between there, but it's not so clear. And the theory is not so, um, so well confirmed also by simulations. What would be the picture in case of the long GBs, in, in case of the collapse of the very massive star? So, in this case, obviously, we start with a very massive star. Here we, we have a Wolf-Rayet star. 
Wolverine star, it's just a very fancy name for a star which has lost all his hydrogen and this hydrogen just floats out away from the star in something that we call a stellar wind. It just means that stuff is moving away and you only have the inner core of the very, very massive star in the center. Now, um, for a very, very long time, that star with this stellar wind is stable. However, at some point, um, something very common for stars happen, which is the stellar collapse. What does that mean? So typically, a stable star is in pressure balance. You have the gravitational pressure from outside that pressures in, <laughs> and from the inside, you have the, um, the radiation pressure, and they, are, they balance each other and nothing happens. But then at some point, the radiation pressure is not large enough anymore, and the inward pressure dominates, and the whole thing collapses and does something that probably you've heard of, it goes boom, and it does a supernova. But not only does it do that, actually, what it leaves behind is, yay, a black hole <laughs> that is somehow surrounded by the leftovers of the star that we had in the beginning, and again, the black hole, it can launch the jet that we were searching for. Now, this is very, like, pretty schematic pictures. How would we actually confirm this? The problem with GIBs is that they are very tiny in size. So if you have a black hole in the center of a, of a galaxy, it's a huge system. And actually, you can take pictures in different wavelengths of the jet. Now, recently, they also started taking pictures of the, of the bottom of the jet. GIBs, stellar mass black holes, a lot smaller, and also more far away. So no way you're going to see that jet. Instead, we have to rely on simulations of these systems. The good news is that over the last decades, there were amazing advances in these fields, and we are now able to generate self-consistently jets in GRMHD simulations. And now I'm not sure if this is going to work. No, I need to move here, right? Yeah. Um, so what you do in these simulations, typically, um, is that you have... No? <laughs> Um, you start with some kind of system that you know it's going to be there. So, for example, you have some envelope and you put in a black hole and then the system and, and some kind of magnetic field configuration and then the system like here, uh, the neutron star merger, itself consistently generates the jet and it, uh, you are able to follow the jet propagation through the surrounding material and it gets free and everything very pretty. The same actually also works for collapsars. Again, here you see that there is a black hole that we put in the simulation by hand in the beginning, then around it is the rest, what was left over from the star, and the simulation self-consistently generates the jet which pierces through this uh, stellar envelope, and nowadays we can even uh, take into account the interaction between the jet and this envelope, which has substantial effects on the jet. At some point, again, it breaks free, and you see this wobbly thing. Um, this is actually the GIB jet that is supposed to shine later on. Okay, great. So we have the central black, uh, the central black hole, and we have the jet. But now we need to understand how the jet shines, what produces the gamma rays that we can observe on Earth. Um, in order to, to understand this, we take a hint from observations and we look at the spectra. In astroparticle ph physics, we categorize spectra uh, in, in a very simple way. On the one hand, we have thermal spectra, and on the other hand, we have non-thermal spectra. Thermal spectra come from the motion of hot particles, for example, in our sun. And for a thermal spectrum, if you know the temperature, you know exactly how many, f number, how many photons you have in, at, at which energy. They're very well characterized and very deterministic in that sense. On the other hand, non-thermal spectra look quite different. And I'm showing here on the left typical uh, spectra for GRBs. And you, the first thing that you can already see is that it's quite different. So, Obviously, it's not a thermal one. You can also see that they are not this spiky structure, but instead you have these straight lines. Now, these straight lines are here in a log-log representation. That's actually a power law decay. Something that is also important for observations later is that you have a lot more photons at the low energies than at the high energies. 
So whatever kind of detector you build, you need to compensate for that. <laughs> but overall, we know from the spectra that there must be some efficient particle acceleration going on in GIBs. Now, how do we accelerate particles in space? The prime contender is always shocks. <laughs> a shock occurs if you have some kind of plasma and it hits a slower plasma and that interaction occurs um, very fast, then it cannot pressure equilibrate. And we have an astrophysical shock, like what you can see here, it's um, a supernova shock, actually, but it's also in a, there in other objects. Now, if you have around that shock electrons and protons, and you also have some magnetic fields, then these electrons and protons, they can bounce back and forth the shock m repeated times, and every time they cross the shock, they get more energetic. And in the end, I can get a non-thermal particle distribution, and that non-thermal particle distribution can produce non-thermal radiation, like the one that we observe in GIBs. So what does it mean? Do we actually know how GIBs shine? Well, the first thing that we know is that very close to the central black hole, they don't shine at all, because it's super dense. No way, your photons are never gonna get out there. Close to the central black hole, nothing is shining. But then, <laughs> if you get a bit further out with your jet, then, hello? Ah, okay. <laughs> then um, particles may be accelerated within the jet. And it could in indeed be those shocks. Like you could imagine a jet where you have um, parts that are moving slower and parts that are moving faster. And you create these shocks that I was just talking about. And you can have the acceleration around it. However, I have to say that for GBs we don't really know. It could also be that there is magnetic reconnection going on and that is accelerating the particles. Honestly, the prompt phase, it's still a bit of a mystery. Something that we understand a lot better is the afterglow, because here you really have that nice um, shock that uh, we were seeing before. Because the jet, it rushes into the medium that is around it. And as it rushes into that medium, you, at the front of the, uh, of the jet, you actually have a shock front. And indeed, the theory that we have for the particle acceleration it works out nicely and we can describe well the afterglow spectrum and the temporal behavior. So, um, let's bring it back, because now um, you hopefully have an idea of how a GAB looks like. Let's maybe bring it back uh, to observations nowadays. And for this, just a brick, quick recap. In which energy ranges are we now expecting to see a GAB? So the prompt emission, by all the mechanisms that I described to you, it will mostly shine in gamma rays. Well, it's still a gamma ray burst, right? It probably it's also going to shine at a bit lower energies, but the main amount of energy, by all the mechanisms, it's dumped in the higher energy range. Um, the afterglow, instead, uh, it, it also starts with a broadband spectrum at very high energies, when the jet is still very energetic. But then, as the jet is slowed down, over time, over the days, over the months, the photons also become less energetic because the whole system carries less energy. And maybe I can give back to you now and you tell us, uh, because we, we ended up end of the 90s, maybe you can understand now how we detect photons nowadays, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, right, we've got to move on from the 90s, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right, so we just heard about what we expect to see from a GRB. Okay, how do we actually see those photons from those GRBs? Um, and so one thing you can see here, here is a sort of schematic view of the electromagnetic spectrum, where you can see the optical photons in the middle, the ones we can see with our eyes at around one electron volt in energy. And then on the, uh, on the far end, we see radio waves from GRBs at 10 to the negative 12 electron volts, so much smaller, much less energetic. On the higher end, we see very high energy gamma rays. Again, astronomers are very creative with our names, so the really high energy ones we call very high energy. These have 10 to the 12 electron volts of energy. So that's 10 to the negative 12, 10 to the positive 12. That's 10 to the 24 times steps, no, 24 steps of 10 in between, right? So that's a huge energy range over which we want to observe gamma ray bursts. So we need a lot of different kinds of observatories and telescopes to do this. 
So what kind of observatory you build will depend on what wavelength or what energy range you care about and also what the atmosphere is doing at those energies. Because the atmosphere is transparent to some parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We know it's mostly transparent to optical photons because we can see you know, stars and the sun and stuff. Um, and it's mostly transparent to a large part of the radio spectrum, a radio part of the spectrum, because that's, I mean, that's how we communicate with satellites and GPS satellites and everything like that. Um, but there's a lot in between or on the uh, high energy side where the atmosphere is opaque. So those waves, those, that radiation cannot penetrate through, uh, which is a good thing because, you know, we have to live on Earth or whatever and we don't want all this radiation. It's fine. So depending on where you're looking, that will tell you what kind of telescope you want to build and where. So you might build your large radio dishes or your radio uh, dish arrays on the ground. Um, you might also build these very large um, optical telescopes on the ground, or you might go into space like Hubble, um, depending on what you want to look for, the pros and cons to both. But if you want to look for gamma ray bursts, if you want to detect those gamma ray bursts in gamma rays or high energy x-rays, you really need to go into space. So how do we detect gamma rays then? Well, let's start by talking about how we detect optical photons. So photons we see with our eyes. These are photons, again, with energies at around one electron volt. So in general, for an optical photon, you have some sort of focuser. Usually these days it's a lens, it used to be a mirror, but so you have a lens of some sort. This focuses all of those photons that come in into one single point or plate or sort of general location um, onto something on a photosensitive surface. So this is a surface that can exactly detect these photons and it says, aha, uh -huh, I detected a red one, a green one, a blue one. Um, and then you get an electric signal out of that and then you can save all these signals together and you build up your picture. So this is roughly how our eyes work. This is also a very simple view of how cameras and backyard telescopes work. Um, if you want to go to higher energies, if you want to go to gamma rays at one kilo electron volt or a mega electron volt, so 10 to the three or 10 to the six electron volts, you have to use different strategies. If you're at a kilo electron volt or a mega electron volt, you might use scintillator detectors. So what a scintillator is, it's just something that glows when it's hit by a photon of a certain energy. Um, so in this case, we're interested in scintillators that glow when they're hit by, or, or that things that glow when they're hit by photons of one keV or, M, or one MeV in energy. Now this glow is just optical photons. These photons are then collected and go into some sort of signal multiplier or a photo, or a photo multiplier. Um, and this sort of increases the strength of the signal so you can really measure it. And then at the end, you have an electric signal that comes out that you can work backwards and figure out the properties of your original photon. And this is uh, what happens on some of the detectors on the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which is one of the biggest, or one of the main gamma ray burst detectors right now. Um, and there are all these uh, silico uh, scintillating, scintillator detectors spread out across Fermi, all over it, so that it can see the whole sky in combination. Um, and so here, the photon enters from the left, signals read out from the right. So this works when you're at one kilo electron volt, one mega electron volt. If you want to go up higher to one giga electron volt, so 10 to the nine electron volts, um, you have to use a different strategy. You might then instead have a chunk of very uh, dense, heavy, um, high atomic number material. So this causes, this means that your photon, your gamma ray comes in, it will convert into electron positron pair. And then that electron and that positron, that will travel through your detector. And when you have an electron and positron traveling through your detector, that changes, you know, that, that creates holes and that changes um, the electrical configuration in your device, then you can follow those paths and you can figure out, well, where those uh, charged particles were coming from and therefore where that, where that original photon was coming from. And therefore you get out, again, an electric signal to understand the properties of the original gamma ray. And here we're seeing, um, a cutaway view of the other telescope on Fermi that uh, detects gamma rays at around one giga electron volt using exactly this method. Um, and how big are these? How big are the, uh, these sorts of gamma ray detectors? Well, here are two pictures of Fermi in the clean room before launch um, with a couple of humans to scale. And you can see that these detectors are, you know, one meter, two meters in length with height. So these are fairly big. Um, and we need 
volumes that are this big in order to have enough stopping power. Because it's hard to stop gamma rays, they have a lot of energy. So you really need to build a big detector to stop gamma rays. Which means at some point, you can't build a detector in space really big enough to stop gamma rays of even higher and higher energies. Because then you go back to your funding agency and they say, no, you cannot launch that. Um, and so if you want to detect photons of, let's say, one tera electron volt, so we're at 10 to the 12 electron volts now, you actually have to come back down to Earth to do so. Um, and I said, OK, well, the Earth's atmosphere is opaque to photons of that energy. Well, then how do we actually use it? Well, what this means, the Earth's atmosphere being opaque, it means that when a gamma ray with an energy of a tera electron volt, when it comes in, it hits the particles in the Earth's atmosphere, and it doesn't survive. And in particular, it turns into a cascade of subatomic particles, and these particles, extremely energetic, going very close to the speed of light. And as this whole shower propagates, the shower grows bigger and bigger. You have more and more of these subatomic particles that are extremely energetic. And if you have a couple of very well-placed water tanks, let's say, those particles are going to go through the water tank, um, and, but they're not going to lose a lot of energy or they're not going to slow down when they hit the water because they're particles. Um, but light that goes through that water will slow down a lot um, due to the density of water. What this means is that these particles, when they hit the water, they're actually traveling faster than the speed of light in water. And they create a flash of blue light called Cherenkov radiation, which is really just the light equivalent of a sonic boom. So sonic boom to sound, Cherenkov radiation to light. So this is a flash of blue light. And if you have a lot of very strategically placed water tanks with a lot of very strategically carefully tuned electronics inside, um, then you can see the pattern of which water tanks are hit by Cherenkov light and how much and when. Um, and this lets you work backwards to figure out the properties of the original photon that hit the Earth's atmosphere and turn into a particle uh, cascade. And the most recent, most up-to-date version of this type of detector is called the Large High Altitude Air Shower Observatory, or LASO, located in the highlands of China. Um, and on the left here, you see an overhead view of what one of these might look like, of what one of these observatories look like, looks like. So there are tons of water tanks all over the place, as well as other kinds of detectors in this observatory. Um, and so, yeah, so this brings us, I guess, relatively up-to-date. Yeah, now we can actually talk about why we wanted to give that talk and right. the boats and all that, maybe? Right, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Right. you go. <laughs> right, so we talked about gamma ray bursts in general, what are we doing to observe them, blah, blah, blah. Um, now let's go back to this one very spectacular gamma ray burst that happened in October of last year that created all of these uh, very exciting um, headlines. So this is what the public was seeing, very, a lot of excitement. What was going on? What was going on on astronomers' computers? What were astronomers seeing during this time? Let's pull the curtain back a little bit. So astronomers, with our supercomputers and our computing clusters and our high computing throughput blah, algorithm, blah, blah, uh, we were refreshing a web page um, to see text documents. So to be clear, there are a lot of ways that telescopes communicate with each other and, uh, autonomously, rapidly, uh, very clever ways. Um, but also, the slow humans have to communicate with each other as well. And we do that through text documents um, to a one central server, uh, and we just call these circulars. So just walking through a couple of the things that happened, so as I was refreshing the page and seeing what was going on that day, um, there's first this circular by this one satellite SWIFT, which detects a lot of gamma ray bursts, and the SWIFT people said, okay, we found something. We thought it came from the galaxy, but now we're not so sure. So we think now it might be a gamma ray burst. If it's a gamma ray burst, it's extremely energetic. Um, and so everyone else should go look at it to see if we're right and to see if it is extremely special. Um, this was followed by another satellite, Fermi, uh, again, one of these big, um, these uh, prolific gamma ray burst detectors. The, the Fermi people said, yeah, we also saw this GRB. Um, it's among the brightest we've ever detected, so it's definitely something special. Everyone, please go look at it followed by another message saying, not only do we detect this GRB, we definitely detect high energy emission. So we detect giga, giga electron volt photons from it. Um, and so everyone started to get excited about this one GRB. Um, 
And other gamma ray observatories also jumped in and said, we see these too. Um, and by the way, if you want to see sort of the full set of messages, if you go to R21, you can see all the text documents in all their glory of astronomers talking to each other across the world. Um, so a little while later, an optical observatory, the VLT, they were able to take a spectrum of this GRB. And this was key because this finally told us how far away the GRB is. And they found it's at a redshift of 0 0.151, which is a light travel time of two times 10 to the nine years, which sounds really far. But remember, we detect GRBs out to redshifts of one, two, three, four, five. So 0 0.151 is actually right in our backyard. So it's extremely close. We already knew it was extremely bright. So here is something that's pretty special. And confirmed by other observatories, lots of other people talking about it. The circular that really had the whole community in a tizzy was this one circular, uh, this one message by LASSO. So the uh, observatory we talked about that can detect TEV photons. And they said that they detected this GRB at energies above 500 GeV, even above 10 TeV. This was exciting because this is the first time we've detected photons at these high energies from a GRB, which means this is the first time we've observed a GRB at that extreme of an energy. This is also the very first time we've ever detected a GRB using this type of observatory. So this is a really exciting time. And there was also of, lots of other, I mean, again, I don't want to shortchange anyone, but there's tons of other uh, discussions and observatories um, monitoring this GRB, um, as well as continued observations. Um, and because it was so bright, someone called it the brightest of all time. So that's where we end up with the boat. So that's where we are. I told you astronomers are really great at naming things. So this is the boat. Okay, but all time is a long... We're finally at the boat. But all time is a really long time. What does this mean? Brightest of all time. What is that really? So in order to get an idea for how bright something is and how long all time is, we can compare it to previous record breakers. So if we look at the prompt emission, which is that initial flash of gamma rays, we compare it to the previous record breaker from 2013. So this was a GRB previous record holder that we said, oh my god, nearby ordinary monster, it saturated all our detectors, oh, we will never get one such as nice as this one. Um, so we were all very impressed by this GRB in 2013. When we compare this one to the new one, easy. Easily dwarfed the last one, right? The peak is twice as high, you know, we, it, it's, it's much brighter than before, so we have a much nicer GRB. Um, but this is not the end of the story. Because in fact, it was so bright, it was too bright, it caused problems for our detectors, for the most sensitive detectors. So going back to these scintillating detectors, or scintillator detectors, these are ones where the photon comes in, converts to an electric signal um, through a, a glowing crystal, and you, get an and you get some information out. The electric signal, the shape of that pulse, depends on the properties of the initial photon. And it takes a little while for your system to then um, go back and relax again. But this amount of time is like microseconds, which is usually fine. That's not a problem, right? Yeah, it's a problem if you have too many photons coming in at once. Because then all of these pulses are piling onto each other. And so multiple pulses are hitting before you can read one out. So you're really undercounting how many photons you truly have. And when you correct for that undercounting, we're in a different ballpark altogether. We can barely, you know, the old one we barely even care about. So this new GRB, clearly the prompt emission was really bright. The afterglow emission was also so bright that we thought maybe something is wrong with our detectors. Maybe it's too bright. Um, what you're seeing here are the afterglow light curves, so brightness over time, for a large population of GRBs and this latest one in pink. And at the very beginning, it was 10 times brighter than anything else we ever saw, hundreds of times brighter, thousands of times brighter than the average GRB. So this is something that's clearly very special on Earth. And we can quantify how special on Earth. Because if you take a look at how much energy your detector, ha your detector measured from this GRB, you can, you can get a sense for, OK, the, the ones that are, uh, in general, we expect to detect a lot of mediocre GRBs, not very energetic ones. The really energetic ones should be pretty rare, and we can quantify how rare that is based on the, uh, what our observatories actually saw over the years. And when we do that, we see that this GRB on the left-hand side, this is the plot for the prompt emission, this GRB shows, you know, we have this expectation of how many bright GRBs we would get, and this GRB, which is indicated by the stars, is much above this expectation. And when we quantify how far above this expectation we actually are, 
we have a once in a 10,000 year event. So this is what all time means, it's 10,000 years. Um, this is pretty long compared to an astronomer's uh, uh, career. Um, so, <laughs> fine, pretty special, average astronomer. Um, but okay, you might say, wait a second, but that's just because it was particularly close. If I were farther away, maybe this GRB wouldn't be so special. So can we in some way figure out how special the GRB is intrinsically? Yeah, sure, because honestly, the observational part, not so much mine. So let's move it back to the source. And what you can see here is the intrinsic energy of the GRB. On the left-hand side of the prompt emission, on, on the right-hand side, it's the flux transferred back close to the GRB. What you can see on the left, on the y-axis, is um, a distribution of, of GRBs, a lot of them that, that we have observed, in their um, isotropic energy. And you can see, yes, the boat, it's kind of an outlier. Like, I think it's the... I think it has the highest intrinsic isotropic energy that we've ever detected, but there are some others that were pretty, pretty close. So yes, it's super energetic, but not extreme in the sense of we would never expect it. What makes it so, so unique is the combination of the low redshift and or the, the, the close distance and this intrinsic energy. And this is also confirmed by the afterglow, which if you convert it to the intrinsic afterglow, to the intrinsic energy flux, well, it's just among the others, right? It's not so special anymore. Something to point out here also about this prompt phase um, energy is that what I'm showing here is the isotropic energy. Now, yes, GFVs have jets which are not isotropic, but collimated. But very often we just don't know how big that jet actually is, what's the opening angle. So what we do instead is we calculate what would be the energy if it were emitting on a sphere, <laughs> just not to make the error of assuming something. Of course, the true energy of the event is just a small percentage that is concentrated in that jet. And as it turns out, there are some hints from observations that for the boat, the jet was spectacularly narrow, which also means that the percentage that was in that jet, it wasn't that much. So in that sense, the GAB was not that extremely energetic, just it was very narrow. Okay, so that means there was nothing so interesting about the GAB. Well, indeed, actually there was, and the most surprising and exciting announcement for theorists was indeed this very, very high energy observation because that was unseen and typically new data means we can get some new insights. The first thing that you might ask is, was that um, TV observation, was it the prompt emission or the afterglow? And for the prompt emission, again, uh, to, <laughs> to phrase it again, for the prompt emission, the, the event was very common in a sense, like all the other characteristics, the temporal and also the spectrum, it was kind of what we would expect for a GRB that comes from a massive star collapse, only we had really bad data because what Sylvia explained with these pileups, it means that there's bad time intervals during which you can't really use the data. Great. On the other hand, okay, so this is the prompt, uh, the TV emission. It also started during the prompt phase, but it showed a very distinct uh, time profile. If you, would ex if you expect the um, TV emission to come from the prompt phase, then it should be somehow correlated in the temporal profile. Since we don't see that, and since that, uh, <laughs> that decay of the emission is very indicative of an afterglow, we are quite sure that this new TV observation is associated with the afterglow of the event, with the onset of the afterglow, so with the onset of the deceleration of that jet. So was there something new that we could make out of it? Yes. <laughs> so they released the data in two chunks. <laughs> the first one was going up to roughly 5 TV. That's the symbols that are not filled. And for these symbols that are not filled, they've, they built a very nice physically motivated model that could explain not only the, their data, but also the, the data at lower energy, so x-rays, everything that was there at the same time. Then at a later point, they released the, date, these, the filled data points that are the really, really highest energies. And what you can see here already is 
the model, these lines that they produced before, they don't explain that new data, that the very high energy ones. Now, unfortunately, as it turns out, this kind of model, you cannot just tweak it and make it extend to higher energies. Because remember, it's a physically motivated model. You have some boundaries of what is feasible and what can happen. Like the processes, they have their limits. OK, so you may think, shit, my model, it doesn't, it doesn't explain the data anymore. I can tell you, there's a very, very easy fix as a theorist. You just introduce a new component, something new, shining at a different wavelength, and you add it on top. It's very common. <laughs> um, what, what, what could be that new component? Well, the most, for me, <laughs> the most logical thing that it could be, and also papers that, that did that, use that kind of approach, is maybe um, this new component arises if we increase the model complexity, if we account for some, some aspect that we didn't account before. An example could be, right now, in the modeling, a lot of times we just take the jet as a uniform thing. What if the jet was not uniform? What if, for example, it had a narrow cone, a core, that is very energetic, and then wings that are less energetic? And the additional signal could come from these wings. Or what if, protons were accelerated on top of electrons, and they could generate that, that um, additional signal. Okay, but this is my kind of favorite way to approach this. There's also, uh, also other people who do particle physics. Um, more specifically, I am um, beyond the standard model particle physics. And they, in this additional component, they see something exotic, like um, dark matter, axions, all of that. And yes, of course, I'm... I'm I'm very biased here, right? I come from a certain point of view. And maybe they are also right. Just in my point of view, I think we should first explore a more complex setup when we model the GRB. And if all of that doesn't work out, then, then maybe resort to the non-standard things. There is actually one last explanation that is not modeling connected, but rather how we correct the data. Because what happens at the highest energies is that photons are absorbed on their way to Earth. And as it turns out, how much they are observed, uh, observed, absorbed, uh, we don't really know. Because we, are, we don't have very precise measurements of all the photon fields in the universe. And if, for example, we use a different model for that, observation, uh, for that absorption, we could also make it work. Like, I, in my view, on the right-hand side, the model always, almost explains the data, no? So a lot of different possibilities. And coming to summarize, what does it mean? Where do we stand? The astronomer, uh, astronomers, they gave us a boat. Yep. But in my, in my personal point of view, they gave us this. <laughs> and now it's up to us to piece it together and to find out what collimated that jet and what made that additional component, and many more papers are to follow. Okay. Thank you both uh, up until this point. We have a little bit of time left for questions, so if you have questions in the room, please come to one of the four microphones, and we'll just uh, get started with a question from our signal angel relaying a question from the internet. Hello, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, so the internet um, would love to um, understand a little bit better how the um, propagation velocities of the X-ray fronts work. How does it all brings together with the GBRs, uh, GRB, sorry, um, and, and what is this? Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, so the, you have these X-ray fronts around the GRB, as far as I understood, so my physics is not so strong, but um, and um, the internet is interested in um, how these propagation fronts actually work, how we absorb them, and so on. Uh, are you referring to the, the last point that Aniko was talking about? Yes. Okay. The absorption. Ah, the absorption that happens. Um, oof, that is actually the very high, very high energy gamma rays. What happens is that they interact. So all in the universe, you have background fields. Uh, 
photon background fields that we call extragalactic background fields. They are of very low energy. The very high energy photons that come from very far away objects, they can interact with these and they surpass the energy threshold to do electron-positron pair creation. And since for the photon that creates the electron-positron pair, this is a very catastrophic thing to happen because afterward it's not there anymore, because instead you have the two leptons, they are absorbed. Um, and the level of this absorption just depends on, well, the background field that it, it encounters on the way, that it could interact with. And we don't have very good measurements of these. That's the issue. Right, please. Um, I think, thank you for the talk. Um, um, I wanted to ask how wide are these gamma ray bursts? Because you said they are very narrow and not isotropic. Yeah. And how, in other words, how easy is it to miss them here on Earth? Oh, quite, quite easy. Um, so up to 10 degrees, I would say. We don't have very good measurements of uh, jet opening angles. It's a hard thing to, to, to actually measure. Typically, I would say something like five degrees opening angle. Oh. And if you're worried about uh, gamma ray bursts destroying Earth, um, so, so, right, so part of the issue is, I mean, short answer, no. Um, but part of it is because, okay, the opening angles, the jets are narrow, so that already lowers your chances. Um, also, gamma ray bursts, as we heard, come from, especially the collapsing star ones, they come from the most uh, really massive stars, uh, most extreme stars, which are already rare. Um, and those types of stars are, aren't really formed in galaxies similar to, the Earth, or to, similar to the Milky Way and galaxies around us. So those are more common, much farther away. Um, so all of that combined, very unlikely, I don't know the exact number, very unlikely, um, but if a gamma ray burst were really close to Earth, yeah, it would just, you know, vaporize everything, everything would die. If it were in this intermediate distance, um, <laughs> that's actually worse because it would cause the nitrogen and the oxygen in the atmosphere to turn into, I think, nitrous dioxide, which is a brown gas. It's the one that's not laughing gas. It's the other one, the less fun one. It's a brown gas, everything dies. Uh, so you would hope it'd be really close or really far away. Luckily, they're all really far away. It's fine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, let's move to mic three. Hi, uh, hi. thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is related to multi-messenger astronomy. And in particular, has this, has this phenomenon been observed through perhaps gravitational waves? or different things okay. that might shine a, yeah. a light to explain why it was so different? Um, this one, you no, know, gravitational wave, so it's a massive star collapse. Um, this is not easily observable by gravitational waves, at least no, most of the time. Strange. Most of the time it doesn't produce the gravitational waves um, that we would observe, different frequency range and also different process than the neutron star merger. There were um, multi-messenger also means, means neutrinos. Uh, IceCube was looking for neutrinos. I mean, they're always looking for neutrinos. It's always operational. They didn't see anything. Um, it did not. They, it does. This gives some constraints. In my view, however, they are not spectacular. It's something very common. The, the constraints that you get out of it are normal. <laughs> Thanks. All right, another question from our signal angel. Um, and that's a very uh, practical one. So is there any good sources on data for real-time gamma ray bursts that, that one can follow, like a map or something like this that you could recommend? Yeah, actually, uh, if you're interested in gamma ray bursts, there's this one uh, recent website um, uh, project called Astro Colibri. Um, you can just Google it. They're also on social media. Yeah. Um, and so they're really good for uh, co uh, getting all of this information together into a single place so you don't have to scour through um, lots of text files. Um, but then you can see you know, a map of the sky and you can say, oh, I'm interested in gamma ray bursts from this day to this day. Oh, I like this one. Let me find out more about it. Um, so that's Astro Colibri, C-O-L-I-B-R-I, -I, I think. Um, so if you yes. Google that or search for that, you will find uh, a good resource there. Awesome. Let's go to the mic in the back. Yes, hello. Thank you for the very nice talk. Um, there are a couple of CubeSat missions um, yes. with uh, small gamma ray detectors claiming yes. that they also want to detect gamma ray bursts and map them, and we need more of that to cover the whole sky. Yes. So my question is, um, have these small detectors the capability of actually producing meaningful data? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, so the, the CubeSat, right, the part of the problem right now is that uh, the governments don't really want to put up large uh, gamma ray burst detectors anymore. I don't know, it's fine. Um, they want to look at other things like exoplanets. 
Um, but so instead, yeah, you would need maybe a lot of smaller detectors, so these CubeSats. Um, and with their, so this really bright GRB was actually detected by a CubeSat, um, GRB Alpha, and this data is also, um, or this uh, information is also there in the, the sort of list of circulars um, if you want to take a look at it. Um, and I think the CubeSats will play more and more important role as our current satellites are aging. Um, and CubeSats are very cheap to put up, and so if you have a lot of them, then you can really cover, like, as you say, a large part of the sky, and you really get good coverage, good information about it then. So um, yeah, CubeSats, absolutely crucial, and uh, will become even more so in the next decade. Okay, microphone number one. Um, I hope this is not a very silly question, but is it thinkable that we could perhaps uh, also observe the um, intermediate space between the GRBs and us? So bluntly, could we see dark matter? Uh, the, that or we could observe this the space if it gives us some information about like I guess like an AG and if it gives some information about um, what's in between us and the GRB sort I of mean, like with gravitational uh, gravitational lenses yes I mean something that definitely comes into mind is absorption um, because what we can for example that very bright GRB uh, was actually behind the Milky Way somehow and that meant that it underwent a lot of absorption due to dust. And this produced very, very clear features that helped reconstruct the dust in the Milky Way and on the way. So this is some way that it could work. Uh, the gravitational lensing, I don't think it's something very commonly done in GRBs. Yeah, I think people look for it, but we haven't, you know, I don't know what the likelihood is or anything like that. Yeah. It is something that people look for, yeah. No, I just meant, I didn't mean it would be gravitational lenses, it's just fine. like yeah. some kind of disturbing... Yeah. No, it's, yeah. A fair, yeah. it's a fair question, though, because yeah. it is something yeah. that people look for, so it's a yeah. fair question, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, my answer would probably be dust absorption is something that happens and that is also used in order to constrain what happens in between. Okay, fair, thanks. Okay, let's go to mic number three. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, one question I had is, you said that these gamma ray bursts are actually focused in some way, mm -hmm. but I understand the jets that are exiting your black mm -hmm. hole, those are matter-based um, uh, jets of some sort, and then in there the electrons flow that will actually produce the photons mm -hmm. that will then yeah. reach us. But what mechanisms focuses the photons? Ah, um, okay. So first of all, in the beginning, the, the jet is not matter-dominated because it's produced by the magnetic fields that are dragged around the black hole. And in the, in the beginning, you tip, if you go for the black hole explanation of all of it, um, you have a jet that is dominated, where most of the energy is carried by the magnetic fields. It then picks up uh, material as it propagates outwards. And also this propagation through the, the former star that was there and also other stuff that was around, this focuses the jet. Now, what happens is with the, the focusing of the photons is that if you have uh, electrons that move in that jet and that move relativistically, their emission is, by special relati relativity arguments, focused okay. um, along their Lorentz factor. But this is, yeah, focusing due to the, due to the motion of the whole thing, basically. Okay, thanks. Do we have another question from the internet? Yes. Um, so you already went into the um, yeah into the things being hit by a gamma ray burst. Um, so are there any other correlations um, with gamma ray bursts and other observable phenomena? Um, with the gamma ray bursts, um, so I think we do this more often with supernovae, um, the you know related phenomena. Um, they're more common. Um, and they're closer by, and they also are isotropic, and so it's much easier to be affected by a supernova than a gamma ray burst. Um, but so with that, you would um, for supernova, you do see signs such as, um, I think in either really old trees or layers of the ice, you see some uh, certain types of isotopes um, in some elements that, in a certain pattern, um, because these elements were hit by the energy from the supernova um, in, a, in a way that you can really calculate in a well-defined way. Um, uh, and so, 
if uh, you know if we did have a, G a GRB in our in our history, um, you would basically I think just try to look for certain combinations of isotopes that are hard to form unless you have a big deposit of energy in that way. All right, we have time for one quick last question. So, uh, Mike Four, please. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, my question is related to spectrography. Uh, spectro spectroscopy. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, what kind of lines do you follow, and do you see signs of exotic uh, particle reactions in the in the beams? I think in the spectra, you mostly. I, I think exotic um, interactions would give you a big headache. Um, when you do spectroscopy, it's spectro spectrometry. Spec when you take spectra, yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Exactly. Yeah. When you take spectra, um, you're really depending on um, known lines of known lines of known processes. So um, I think these are usually um, uh, electrons changing energy levels in uh, hydrogen. Atom. Right. Hydrogen is a yeah. big one. Um, so but I ionized hydrogen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have the Lyman alpha, yada, yeah. blah. Yeah. I see. <laughs> uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, yes. Anyone else with questions, just come over there and we can explain whatever you need to be explained. <laughs> of course. Awesome. Yeah, we, as you said, we are at time. Thank you again, Annika and Sylvia.